It's kind of interesting. You may notice that uh, Tony's church life and offertory cuts right in with today's scripture and with Greg Williams. And what I'm going to say today cuts in with the speaking of life that we heard earlier as well. So um, God works to bring things together and deliver his message, which I've been entrusted to deliver today. And let me first say, Father in heaven, thank you for our opportunity to be together to learn from you. And please help me to deliver the message you have given to me to deliver and to deliver it effectively so that we all understand what you are talking about and what you want out of us as your servants and as your family and as your children. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Our scripture uh, reading today was Romans 12 verses one through eight. And uh, you may notice as is often the case when we read scripture written by Paul, we start out with a therefore. And it seems to be popping up very often in this case. And that's because Paul has spent 11 chapters of this letter talking about who God is and the grace that he has for us. So for the remainder of my time here, let's go back and read all 11 chapters leading up to this point. It's a good thing we have a potluck after service today. By the time we finish this, we're going to be hungry. I'm kidding about that, of course. But that's kind of how Paul teaches. See, now that he's told us this, he told us this to tell us that. You know what I mean? Um, he does that. Um, he uses this buildup to appeal to his brothers and sisters on account of God's mercies to be a living sacrifice. And that's why our passage begins with a therefore statement. Everything Paul wants to say in this section rests on what he previously established in this letter. That is kind of an important pattern in scripture that we should be aware of. The commands and admonitions that um, we find in scripture always rest on a foundation that supports them. Namely, that foundation is the heart and character of God. And that's the foundation of all the commands that we see in Scripture. It's on that basis of who God is and what he's done for us that we obey him. So we see that God's commands are not arbitrary. And they're not given to us to rob us of joy in life. Really, it's the opposite. God's commands are an invitation to live out the life of joy and love that he's giving us in Jesus. When we come to see who God is in such a way that we can put our full trust in him, we find obeying him to be a joy and a delight. Why would we not want to listen and follow the words of one who loves us the best and gives us everything. God is not an ogre to avoid. He's the author of life to embrace. Notice the passage begins with the words, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. Now, you know, okay, so what are those? Well, he's listed those. He listed these mercies of God in the first 11 chapters. And he's already argued that justification comes by grace through faith. God has done something in Jesus Christ that sets the world on a whole new basis. And it's not something we did. It's not something we could ever have done on our own merits. It's all God's mercy. To state it in simple terms, Paul has concluded that by God's mercy, we've been set free to live in righteousness. 
before this act of mercy in Jesus Christ were slaves to sin and its power. And slavery is not something that you can free yourself from. It's something that requires a rescue. So Paul holds freedom central to what God's mercies have rescued us from. Take a little short look back and what have we been rescued from? How about freedom from death in Romans 5? How about freedom from sin in Romans 6? How about freedom from the law in Romans 7? Now that's kind of a sticky one for some people because uh, the freedom of the law gave rise to a lot of criticism about Paul because they thought he was teaching that, um, that anything goes morality, do anything you want to because the law is done away. And that's not what he was talking about. Actually, starting with today's chapter and going on beyond that, Paul shows those accusations to be a total misunderstanding of what it means to be free. And we need to keep in mind a few other things too, arguments that Paul has made before we go on. As we set out to live in the freedom that God has given us, we don't do that on our own either. We do it in union with Christ. Romans 8 says, we receive the gift of the Spirit and we see God's plan to bring believers to conform to the image of the Son. And in Romans 11, we're reminded of God's faithfulness to keep his promises. So we're not in a situation where God has set us free to live apart from him. That wasn't the freedom that we were created for. We've been freed in Jesus to be in relationship with the Father, Son, and Spirit. And this is a freedom that will set us free in all our other relationships as well. On that note, let's explore this passage by looking at, uh, let's look at three relationships that God set us free to live out. Now the first one is our relationship with God. The second one would be our relationship with the world. And the third, is our relationship with fellow believers, the church. On account of God's mercy setting us free to live in the freedom God's given us in Christ, we can see Paul's invitation to live as God intended, not as slaves, but as his children, the children that he loves. So let's talk about that relationship with God he says in Romans 12, verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Only on account of what Jesus has done can we have paradoxical statements like this, living sacrifice. I mean, shouldn't a sacrifice be dead? That's the normal situation. But being a living sacrifice is Paul's way of speaking of our response to the grace and mercy held out to us in Jesus Christ. In Jesus, we've been included in the very life of the triune God. For Paul, worship is embracing this in every aspect of our daily lives. Or we could say that worship is living in the true freedom that we were created for. And notice that this life of worship is carried out in bodies. If slavery can be defined by one major hall uh, hallmark, it, would be the loss of control over one's own body. You've got to realize this, that a slave's body was the property of their owners. And on this ground, a, ma a master could use a slave's body for labor or profit or misuse a slave's body, treat them poorly, and get no repercussions for that. Well, slavery to sin 
also takes place in an embodied existence. You ever found yourself doing things with your body that you kind of wish you hadn't? Paul did. He spoke about it. He spoke of his own experience in this chapter, in, in chapter 7. And see, that's the power of the slave master. The slave master of sin. That's what the mercies of God have freed us from. Now, on account of Jesus' sacrifice, we're free to present our bodies in all that we do in worship, in worship of God. And that's the way we were created to relate to God. To worship God is to enjoy Him and truly live in freedom. And this worship entails sacrifice, but it's not a sacrifice that amounts to death. Happy to hear that say that. It's a way of living. Paul is clearly using the word sacrifice in, an, in a brand new way. See, the normal religious sacrifices of the day would amount to the death of the body of the sacrifice. It was cut into pieces and the blood was drained. And so there's not much chance that any kind of life is going to come from that. But the way that Paul is using sacrifice implies living sacrificially. We were talking about that in the... Uh, offertory. You know, Jesus' teachings were filled with, the, uh, filled with the same admonition. You remember Jesus spoke of laying down one's life for a friend, and he told parables like the Good Samaritan that had much the same theme. And you might recall statements like, uh, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The sacrifice we now offer is dying to the sinful, self-willed self and living for another, namely God, which leads into sacrificially living for others. We are free from living in the prison of having the world revolve around our wants and needs. There is an incredible freedom, freedom in turning our inward gaze outward to others, seeking other people's best interest in the light of the gospel, and using our bodies in ways to bless others and to glorify God. There's a relationship with the world. Our scripture reading goes on to say, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. <clears throat> so embracing the life we have in Jesus means that we're free to think differently. You know, we talk about the renewal and the help of the Holy Spirit. Well, our minds have to go through a renewal process, don't they? Before Christ, our minds were captured by the, this world. And maybe to be clear, that word for world here could be better, better translated as age. It's referring to the present evil age and the ways of thinking that pertain to it, what we all grew up thinking, what we all were just all, all raised, and also our human nature. That's our nature to think that way. And maybe we can better picture the pattern of this world as a box a bondage. Uh, and it's a box that Jesus climbed into in order to set us free. If our thinking confirms to that box, we find ourselves hemmed in by the walls of fear, of guilt, and anxiety. But Jesus destroyed those walls and 
set us free to think outside the box. You knew I was going to say that, didn't you? As our minds are renewed, we're transformed to live out the life of Father, Son, and Spirit, a life that Scripture describes as faith, hope, and love. This is the mind of Christ and the life that he's sharing with us in the Spirit. So let's look at the freedom that we have to move from conforming to transforming. We no longer let the world set the agenda. God's word to us in Jesus Christ is our new calling and mission. And we're transformed by this world, by this word. As we are, we'll be better equipped to discern, to understand what God is up to as he frees us from the traps and the snares that are in our path as we travel through this world. And in that understanding, uh, we're set free to relate to the world in a way where we can be a blessing. We serve as witnesses to the world, not by conforming to its walls, not by conforming to the fears and anxieties, but we rather live a transformed life of faith and hope and love. Our witness can point to the good and acceptable and perfect Lord and Savior who has set us free to relate to the world with the mind of Christ. And then there's our relationship with the church and with each other. <clears throat> our scripture goes on to say, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober, sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ. And individually, members one of another, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. A prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, and the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. From here, from this point in the scripture, Paul's speaking of the church. He's still referring to how our thinking has to change. Paul points out that um, instead of aspiring beyond one's gift, believers should recognize each member is part of the body. And each member functions in collaboration. We're all in this together. We're not to think in ways that exalt ourselves over others. That would not be the freedom that Jesus has brought us into. We're talking about our thinking here. Um, this is a thought life of faith, hope, and love where relationships with one another flow out of the relationship of Father, Son, and Spirit. It all comes back to that. The Spirit is giving us that commune with God to make us be more like God towards each other. As believers who embrace His embrace, we live out this life in community with others as one body with many members. Paul goes on to speak, he's talking about the spiritual gifts that are given to the individual members in the body. And he uses that phrase, the measure of faith that God has assigned. 
Now, that doesn't indicate that our faith can be measured or quantified. And it doesn't indicate that God predetermines and limits our faith. Uh, it cuts it down to a measured degree. Understanding this phrase in context shows it refers to the spiritual gifting that has been measured out according to grace. Whether that gift be in speaking, serving, teaching, giving, comforting others, God has shaped the church in her mission to the world so that it has to work from the ground of relationship. That's what we've been called to. There are no lone rangers in the church. No single member has all the gifts that are needed to fulfill God's mission for the church. You know, we're gifted in such a way as to share our gifts one with another in order to engage in the mission of proclaiming the good news to the world. If the life of relationship found in the triune God has been poured out on God's children, it's only fitting that the proclamation of this good news would be heard from a body of believers living in relationship. Here in chapter 12, Paul certainly has not lived up to the accusation that his teaching on justification by grace through faith amounts to a lackadaisical or immoral lifestyle. Quite the contrary. By showing us what we are free from and set free for, we're giving a supremely high calling to live out. It's calling that demands our bodies and minds be completely devoted to the Lord. It's a life that's turned to God in worship and turned to others in service. There's no room for self-justifying or self-serving agendas. We are set free to live in Christ. This is the life of freedom for which God's mercies have set us free. Amen?